So we have three papers for this panel. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce each scholar before their panel. They'll give their papers about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll do Q&A at the end. Um, so we're having great conversations and comments in the YouTube chat, so that's great. Um, I will try as best I can to keep up with the questions, but if anybody wants to help me out and hold their questions until the end, and then we'll ask all three of the panelists if that works for everybody. Our first paper is Martin Leder's X-Ray, The Final Woman and the Medical Slasher Film. He's a research affiliate at the University of Manitoba's Institute for the Humanities. He's the author of Horror Film, A Critical Introduction, The Modern Supernatural in the Beginnings of Cinema, and Halloween, and editor of Cinematic Ghost, Haunting and Spectrality from Silent Cinema to the Digital Era, and refocused the films of William Castle. So now I have to add all those to my reading list. He was published uh, in such journals as Horror Studies, the Canadian Journal of Film Studies, the Journal of Popular Culture, the Journal of Popular Film and Television, Film Journal, and the Journal of Communication and Languages. Welcome so much, Murray. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. I'll just share my screen here. I, I should remark that um, uh, in a way I was drawn to this film, uh, X-Ray, uh, because I, I did a lot of my dissertation research that became my book, The Modern Supernatural and the Beginnings of Cinema. Uh, and it, uh, it dealt in part with uh, the discovery of the X-Ray, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later, and its propinquity with, uh, with early cinema and the supernatural implications thereof. And of course, I learned of, that there was a slasher film called X-Ray. So, um, I was uh, destined, I think, to eventually write about it. And uh, I, in, I don't want to deceive anybody. Uh, this is based on a publication which is already out there in continuum. Uh, it's uh, sort of a cardinal sin, I'm afraid, of uh, presenting on something that's already been published. Um, but and I've sort of honed it down to one thread in that article. And it's, it's funny to be on a panel with nuance in the title because uh, the film itself is not like replete with nuance. Uh, so hopefully I have to bring that nuance. I discuss the early slasher film that uh, uh, both fits and does not fit within Carol Clover's model of the final girl. Directed by Israeli director Boaz Davidson, who mostly specialized in sex comedies and distributed by the exploitation specialist Canon Films, it was released both as X-Ray and Hospital Massacre in 1981, in the thick of the first slasher cycle, obviously. A peculiar film that derives a queasy quality from its tonal strangeness. Uh, it, it's often hard to figure out whether it's taking itself seriously or not. Uh, X-Ray is almost entirely absent from the now voluminous scholarship on the slasher film, perhaps because it's in some ways not the most representative example, but I think it's an interesting one. Certainly many of the familiar uh, character dynamics of uh, Clover's model are in play in X-Ray, especially in terms of the relationship between the assaultive and reactive gazes. Uh, yet its setting of the thinly peopled host, urban hospital, a different setting from the rural and suburban settings of most slasher films, but constructing similar dynamics of isolation, permit those gazes to operate within the paradigm of a Foucaultian medical gaze. And so, so doing, I'm arguing today, invokes a range of anxieties about masculine medicine, its spaces and practitioners. I'm focusing more narrowly on X-ray today, but I think a lot of my points could be extended into other uh, medically themed uh, slasher films and horror films more broadly. Uh, X-ray could be slotted into a long history of horror with medical context, especially those about deranged surgeons like Mad Love and The Raven, as, and later films like Eyes Without a Face and Horror Hospital. The key director associated with medical horror is, of course, David Cronenberg, yet the slasher film had its own dalliances with medical settings, too, including later examples like Dr. Giggle's Anatomy and Valentine. In his book on the slasher film, Adam Rockoff dismisses X-Ray and Visiting Hours from the subsequent year as inferior films which effectively killed off the minor trend of hospital slashers, alongside, of course, the better-known Halloween 2. If X-Ray obviously takes some cues from what were the existing slasher films so-called at that time, of course, that, that label wasn't, wasn't solidified till later. Another significant uh, predecessor is Michael Crichton's more mainstream Hollywood medical thriller, Coma. 
X-ray, uh, echoes coma in its chases through sparsely populated medical facilities, and a third act where a female protagonist named Susan in both films is strapped to a medical table for an unnecessary procedure meant to kill her. Though lofty considerations of medical ethics in, co in coma, um, uh, there is no equivalent to be found in X-ray. Davidson's film contains many of the same anxieties about the hospital space, masculine medicine, and especially female bodies that are on display in a less intellectual fashion, uh, mostly represented at the level of film form. And uh, just to, to talk, of course, we all know the debates about uh, gender and misogyny in the slasher film. X-Ray, I think, is a kind of an interesting example because uh, it does represent the male gaze as violent and sadistic, but there's almost no kind of intellectual distance that's uh, contextualizing that. Uh, and on the other hand, it doesn't really open itself to being read as an indictment of female sexuality in the way that many, uh, many slasher films were. X-Ray Dot only takes place entirely, uh, almost entirely in a hospital, but its villain is a doctor. Uh, it's, it's a little hazy if he's actually a doctor or just impersonating one, um, but he disguises his identity behind a medical mask and manipulates uh, medical imaging to his vile purpose. The film also develops an unease uh, through the recurring emphasis on the medical gaze. In using this term, I'm, of course, evoking the concept that, my, uh, that uh, Michel Foucault introduced in The Birth of the Clinic in 1963, uh, which has been variously rendered as the medical, clinical, or observational gaze, a feature of Foucault's modern uh, episteme as it emerges at the beginning of the 19th century. Cold, empirical, and depersonalizing, the medical gaze is hypothetically detached from the doctor, made anonymous, impartial, and empirical. It also makes its uh, subject essentially feminine, it's been argued, in rendering it uh, uh, to, to a, uh, reducing it rather to a position of passivity, and even as rendering it corpse-like. In X-ray, the medical gaze is on display, uh, not just through any individual character, but rather is attached to the environment itself of the hospital, a place replete with gazes of all kinds, almost all of them pointed at Susan, the protagonist and like the X-ray itself, ultimately aimed at penetrating her inner body. I should say here uh, that Susan is played by Barbie Benton, who was, um, had acted a little, but was best known as a Playboy model. She had appeared on the, the uh, uh, cover of, of Playboy three times, uh, three times prior and once subsequently. I'll get to the significance of that later on. Throughout this presentation, I will use the title X-Ray over the more prosaic Hospital Massacre, uh, partly because the 2014 Blu-ray DVD release from Scream Factory uses the X-Ray title, and partially because I just find it a better title, a more evocative, and a strange way appropriate one. True to its name, the film's opening titles, as you see here, unfold over a succession of X-Ray images, blue and luminous as if displayed on a light box, accompanied by a nervous synthesizer-heavy score, the title sequence establishes the medical gaze as a key theme, as well as tapping into the history of medical imaging in general and x-rays in particular. Uh, x-rays, if you don't know, were unexpectedly discovered by a uh, German physicist, Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen in 1895. And because it was easy to replicate and largely circulated through the popular press rather than scientific channels in, uh, in that, that early period, it triggered an x-ray craze the thread to overshadow the uh, commercial debut of cinema that same year. Uh, X-rays were mind-boggling and arrived in a uh, fin de siècle climate hungry for novelty. The living skeleton, quote-unquote, was previously seen as something of a contradiction in terms, serving mainly as artistic representation, either as the symbol of death or as a guide for anatomists, but now it could be observed. Further x-rays did not so much show the skeleton as it turned bodies inside out, reducing solid flesh to a ghostly, but still perceivable half presence. And as unsexy as skeletons might appear, the x-ray developed a powerful erotic potential in its apparent ability to dissolve all of those uh, layers of Victorian clothing. Oh, sorry, that's Röntgen's uh, famous first image of his wife's hand. And here's a souvenir. Uh, for, uh, there's a long story behind that, but I, I find it funny and show it any chance I get. Um, complaints were voiced about the revolting indecency of the ability to see people's bones with the naked eye. 
And anxieties were voiced about the X-ray's perceived capacity to dissolve sexual identity by figuratively decomposing organs and flesh. The deathly qualities of the X-ray would take on a different inflection once it became clear that the rays were themselves dangerous. Um, the X-ray retains uh, some associations with destruction, invasion, and penetration, writes Akira Lippet. To see and to burn, two functions and effects are fused in the X-ray, which makes the body invisible, makes the body visible rather by burning it. The extra visibility of the X-ray is an effect of its inflammatory force. It sees by burning and destroying. In X-ray, the villain Harry accords with uh, the looking, destroying duality of the X-ray, a spectatorial agent of the gaze in familiar slasher villain form, but at once a penetr uh, uh, pardon me, but simultaneously a penetrating medicalized force that destroys as he gazes. A literal X-ray plays a small, if crucial, role in the plot, serving to mislead and manipulate. Uh, the villain Harry substitutes the protagonist's healthy X-ray for one showing a bizarre medical condition, which seems to show uh, worms or snakes or something writhing about her abdomen uh, in order to detain her at the hospital so that he can uh, stalk and eventually kill her. The film exploits many of the issues with the X-ray and the broader culture of medical imaging, uh, including professionalism, eroticism, privacy, interiority slash exteriority, and death. Like a lot of slasher films, X-Ray starts in the past with an inciting event. Um, in this case, it follows Vera Dika's model of the stalker film very, uh, very slavishly, actually. Uh, on a past Valentine's Day, when the creepy neighborhood kid, Harold, uh, turns lethal after young Susan rejects a, a car card shaped like a heart. We then move forward 19 years to another Valentine's Day, when Susan, a divorced mother, uh, has come to the hospital for routine test required for a new promotion. And here's Susan, uh, the adult Susan. Though this is one of the numerous holiday-based slasher films, X-Ray plays an almost literal background role in the film through the mise-en-scene of the hospital, which is festooned with banners and hearts, uh, all of which tie in with the killer's ultimate motivation to claim uh, Susan's heart, literally. In keeping with the traditional emotional stunting of the slasher film's villains, Harry fails to discriminate po uh, poetic metaphor from corporeal reality uh, as, a, as a, uh, a penance for her destroying that uh, paper heart he wants to extract her actual heart. Over time, the heart symbol migrated from anatomy to being an easily commodified symbol of romantic love. Harry has reversed that trajectory. Now, as I've alluded to, the film's final girl is distinctly a final woman in this film. And indeed, all the victims are uh, in the film are, are adults, save for a prepubescent boy who's killed in the intro. Because of her fame as a nude model, Benson's character is replete with the kind of to-be-looked-at-ness that Laura Mulvey famously ascribed to women on screen. And in this case, deployed within the medical arena. One of the film's most consistent motifs is men staring at her, sometimes leering undisguisedly, as this janitor does in an early scene. But like most final girls slash women, Susan is not only the subject of the look of the killer and of other males, but increasingly possesses an investigative gaze of her own. Uh, so uh, one by one, we see male physicians look at the putative X-ray image of Susan's body and react with contained horror. Yet her apparent condition is not disclosed to her right away. Here's that X-ray image again. Uh, so the doctors contrive to detain her further uh, for further tests. And rather like the female protagonists of earlier films like Dark Victory, The Bells of St. Mary's, and The Nun Story, she is benevolently, in quotes, misled about her apparent malady by the masculine medical establishment. More specifically, she is denied a certain variety of reactive gaze, the ability to look on images of her own body that shield her from, from looking at this x-ray and make decisions accordingly. Uh, this leads to uh, the film's kind of centerpiece, I think, this lengthy protracted physical examination sequence, which I found myself really lingering on when I wrote the, um, when I wrote the essay. Uh, despite the fact that it's uh, both highly ridiculous and all but narratively extraneous, because I think it contains most of the film's uh, themes in, uh, in miniature. Uh, so the doctor of the hospital, Dr. Saxon, who is presented quite sinisterly because, uh, you know, the, we need a lot of red herrings, uh, but he's not actually the killer. In fact, gets murdered later on. 
Uh, he's very insistent on an examination right away. He instructs her now, get undressed, adding only a half-hearted please to his order. Until this point, Susan, having come to the hospital directly from work, has worn business attire. At this point, she sheds it. It only returns in the last scene. Her low-key uh, low battle of wills with Dr. Saxon ends with her reluctantly giving into the authority of male medicine, her own agency compromised. Susan undresses behind a scrim, backlit, her silhouette revealing the contours of her body, and in pure Mulvian fashion, Saxon stands and watches, and the audience shares his gaze. Uh, even against this striptease sequence, however, the film begins to establish the significance of a counter gaze, Susan's own perspective, gazing out from behind the scrim at two doctors inaudibly discussing her, uh, her x-ray uh, via this POV shot. Uh, it is the final girl's formulaic act of reversing the gaze per, per Clover. The subsequent physical examination scene goes on for more than six minutes. Uh, Roy Porter has explained that physical examinations emerged in the 18th and especially 19th centuries. And despite having a relatively limited diagnostic utility, he, uh, this is Porter's quote, the sick have uh, so far come to expect being physically examined that they regard the doctor who omits hands-on examination as negligent. In the film, however, despite her obvious discomfort, Susan reflexively permits the unannounced touching of her body by Saxon as a necessary feature of the medical environment. She lies topless on the examination table as he runs his hands up her legs before prob probing her abdomen. The camera follows up the length of the legs and places her breast fully in, in frame as he moves his stethoscope about, repeating in out in a mistakenly uh, sexualized fashion while the camera blatantly leers at her body. The film also reveals that this examination is itself being spied on by another of the film's red herring characters, a drunken mental patient named Hal, whom Su Susan encountered earlier. The film alternates between his leering face and, and uh, his POV gazing at Susan, framed by an askew curtain and the edge of the door to emphasize the theme of voyeurism. A nurse comes along in the hall and tells him to stop, but he immediately goes back to it as soon as she walks away. From that point on, we see no more of Hal, even though his gaze is pres presumably still present. It just sort of diffuses into the film's mise-en-scene. The sequence continues with uh, Dr. Saxon's use of uh, various tools of examination and extraction, uh, stethoscope and op op <laughs> ophthalmoscope. That's a hard word to say, apparently. And then he takes a blood sample from her. As he uncaps the needle, it is framed against her eye. Uh, the focus rocking between her face and the needle clutching hand. Another striking visualization of Susan's double status as possessing the gaze and as object of the gaze. Susan swabs, uh, sorry, pardon me, Saxon swabs her arm and the film edits between her flinching, his obsessive looking face and the needle's insertion in loving close up. Susan momentarily loses her composure and flinches, a classic example of the reactive gaze. The needle fills with blood again in extreme close-up. And the final shot of the sequence is uh, a small orgasmic spray, spray of blood as the needle is removed. The interplay of the assaultive gaze of Saxon and Susan's reactive gaze are so paramount in the overwrought medical examination sequence as to almost play as self-parody. This scene could perhaps justifiably be described as an empty piece of titillation with next to no narrative justification. But however crudely, it taps into a set of powerful images of male science dominating over a female body. Saxon is putatively checking her body for evidence to support the conditions indicated by the x-ray. Yet this uh, uh, professional objective is thoroughly obscured by the film's audio presentation of the examination. I, I thought of showing this scene, but it is kind of long and uh, it's, it's decidedly porny, if that's a, if that's a verb, or if that's an adjective that I can use. Um, meanwhile, her counter gaze begins to tentatively scrutinize the medical gaze deployed against her. In her book, Sexual Visions, Image of Gender in Science and Medicine between the 18th and 20th centuries, uh, Ludmila Jordanova examines the theme of the unveiling of a female body. She draws attention to the 1899 statue, Nature Unveiling Herself Before Science, which it depicts nature as a young woman veiled except for her breasts, which she is in the process of uncovering. Writes Jordanova, the uh, 
that the statue mobilizes a number of devices commonly used over many centuries, personification veiling the use of breasts to denote femininity, the gendering of both science and nature. The affiliation of science with masculinity and nature with femininity obviously resonates with the examination scene where Saxon is probing Susan's body for non-existent secrets and imperfections hidden within her idealized form. From that scene on, she wears a thin translucent hospital gown that suggests veiling in its skimpiness and the attention that draws to Susan's body even as it conceals it. Um, Jord Jordanova notes that medicine has historically evoked masculine uh, uh, sadism towards women, but also an, uh, an, also an idealization of women, uh, an equally prominent theme as violence. Possibly these two constitute two sides of the same coin. <coughs> Pardon me. X-ray idealizes uh, Susan's body as an image of feminine perfection that Harry's um, machinations have transformed into an object of scrutiny. Many of the film's themes come together in the climactic image of Susan lying on a medical table while the killer pants behind his identity concealing face mask, fondling dissection equipment. It evokes a body, uh, evokes perhaps accidentally, a body of 19th and 20th century artwork that Jordan Nova also discusses, in which one or more figures of medical science stand over the body of a beautiful young woman or the corpse of a beautiful young woman preparing for an autopsy. Jordan Nova draws particular attention to the paintings of anatomist artist John Wilkes Broadnax, preoccupied with such scenes of erotic uh, dissection, both in art and in poetry. One poem written by Broadnax, possibly uh, published and entitled The X-Rays, uh, contains these lines. This comely maiden, once buoyant in life, by the dread hand of disease expires, is now subject to the dissector's knife to carve and mutilate as he desires. In X-Ray, Harry is a version of the slasher villain archetype crossed with a version of Broadnax's erotically obsessed anatomist. Yet also in formulaic slasher film fashion, he is not only a penetrator, but himself penetrated. Susan snatches up a knife and stabs him before escaping. In the chase that follows at the film's climax through the hospital's vacant corridors, she douses him with a convenient flammable liquid sitting lidless on a shelf and flees onto the hospital roof. After a very sexualized study, she uses a lighter to set him on fire. The film's last indignity to the human body is one of overt conflagra conflagration rather than the subtler burning implied in the x-ray, now turned back onto the medical gazer. The conclusion of x-ray is oddly sudden, a few seconds of Susan collecting her wits on the hospital roof, and then a cut to a scene of her emerging from the entrance of the hospital wearing the same dark red business attire uh, that she wore earlier and being jubilantly greeted by her daughter uh, while her ex-husband stands nearby all in mere seconds. A freeze frame of the embrace uh, while the ex-husband stands uh, close uh, remains through the credits. The film is putatively with the but the heroine is not free ending that uh, Viridika finds structurally uh, typical of the slasher of the stalker film rather. Instead, it insists on unconvincingly uh, restoring normalcy and on Susan's reabsorption uh, of the figure of mother, perhaps even reconciliation with her ex-husband. Her victory somewhat anticipates a more triumphant strand of Final Girl, emblematized by Stretch in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, Final Girls who do not simply survive but win. At the same time, the, normalization, uh, the normalizing tendencies of the ending stand opposed to the tensions uh, that the film has articulated about the medical gaze, which outlast Harry, the hospital massacre, and the movie. One can read into the film's truncated conclusion a certain unwillingness to finally deal with its own implications. While it is difficult to dispute Rockoff's assessment of X-Ray as a minor, inferior slasher film, with the film's tonal strangeness, and I, I didn't have much time to get into this, but it has scenes which would seem broad in something like student bodies, um, there comes a sickly quality that goes well beyond the killer's individual pathology, but is attached instead to the entire medical establishment. X-Ray, to be clear, is not some lost subversive masterpiece, but from its messiness comes a peculiar fascination that remains unblunted by its normalizing formulaic ending. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Murray. That was 
really interesting. And I look to seeing the parallels and intersections we have with our next couple of papers. Our next paper is The Maturing of Madness, The Rise of Adult-Centric Slashers in 1982 by Amanda Reyes. She is an academic writer and um, archivist and historian from Austin, Texas. She's the editor and co-author of Are You in the House Alone? A TV movie compendium. She's been a guest speaker and lecturer at international film festivals, movie screenings and academic conferences in places in such places as Australia, England, Scotland, Germany, and stateside in Los Angeles, New York, and Texas. She has published in several books, including Scared, Sacred, Idolatry, Religion, and Worship in the Horror Film, and Yuletide Terror, Christmas Horror on Film and Television. She has contributed commentary tracks for the home release video releases of Last House on the Left, Scream for Help, Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, Pulse and Eyes of a Stranger, among several others. She is a featured guest speaker in several genre film documentaries, including Eli Ross, History of Horror, and Woodland's Dark and Days Bewitched, A History of Folk Horror. She also curated and presented the Alamo Draft House quarterly made for television mystery movie series and has presented TV movies for the Austin Film Society. Welcome, Amanda. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, that was a really pretentious uh, intro I wrote, but um, thank you. Uh, so um, my cat is being a little crazy, so please bear with me um, while I do this. And I've never had to share a screen before with people, but let me see if I can figure out how to do this. And okay, let me know if it's not working for you, but um, let me get started because I have a lot to talk about. So I'm going to be talking about the adult-centric slashers of 1982. Um, I want to thank everybody for inviting me here. It's been a really great conference so far. I'm following up on some really amazing papers. Um, and I'm going to just basically give you uh, a general overview of 1982 and how it was kind of special in the way that it started turning its focus on older characters. So in May of 1982, Variety published a front page article about the woeful state of the oversaturated stock and slash market. Film distributors were hawking titles that buyers felt were practically identical to one another. Over 60 titles, or roughly 25% of movies up for purchase, were of the slasher variety. The markets were exhausted. Variety also noted that in 1981, the lower-tiered horror films were already having a tough time rolling out their products thanks to juggernaut studios such as Paramount moving into their territory. And by 1982, those same majors had grown disenchanted with the subgenre, leaving gaps in theatrical release schedules. So the oversaturation of the market and the takeover by the majors meant that it was hard to get a leg up on the competition. And now critics were also refusing to see a lot of the lower budget releases, claiming too much violence and too many copycats. Filmmakers were still incredibly gung-ho, of course, on the cheap and easy blueprint of the slasher, but production was down and audiences weren't guaranteed to show up in the same surefire numbers. It looked like the slasher film was on its last legs. Admittedly, 1982 did look like more of the same. Unhinged, The House on Sorority Row, Friday the 13th Part 3, Humongous, and Slumber Party Massacre all appeared to fall into the quote-unquote teeny kill pick, a term coined by theorist Robin Wood, and one which Variety often used as a reference towards the onslaught of slashers largely comprised of young adult characters. The trade started asking, where can these films go now? And they actually predicted that fantasy films like Conan and the Barbarian would become the next big box office ticket, leaving the slasher genre a dim, bloodstained memory, right? However, the boom wasn't over yet, and 1982 proved to be a weaker, but still worthwhile, extension of the golden uh, year of 1981. There remain plenty of teens on the run from seemingly unstoppable killers, but there's also an intriguing shift towards movies with older, more mature characters as well. Movies such as The Forest, Visiting Hours, Ghost Dance, Deadly Games, The Last Horror Film, Silent Rage, and The Slayer, among others, fell across many different sections of the slasher spectrum in terms of budget, effectiveness, and legacy. But they had one thing in common. These were all movies about adult characters often dealing with adult issues. Several adult-centric themes appear and are broached. Everything from marital woes to work woes were employed as clever plot and or subtextual devices. There's even a scene in the forest featuring two characters lamenting the 5 p.m. rush hour traffic. And there's a still from that. And that is one of the most relatable, I think, things that any adult goes through when you enter your nine to five life. 
And more often than not, these films embraced an even more nihilistic edge. We still had survivors. We even sometimes had a quote unquote final woman, but this wasn't always guaranteed. Um, two examples right here, not to be too spoilery, but some movies featured no survivors at all. The stakes felt much, much, much higher. Teenagers and younger adults have the rest of their lives to deal with these traumatic events. And despite some of the darker endings, the final girl became a symbol of power and resilience. However, the adults, if they made it to the end of the film, aren't guaranteed the same hope. And therefore, in their own way, the adult-centric uh, slasher releases became fascinating and worthwhile metaphors for the very real hardships of the day-to-day -day survival all grown-ups experience. So four decades after this golden age, and we're still analyzing young adults in the slasher, I think what makes this really ironic is that much of the writing attributed to spectatorship from those aged under 21 could very easily be applied to adult horror viewers. Much has been made of the style and form, as well as the tropes and the way slashers handle metaphors of like the changing face of the family, as well as of course how the subgenre deals with issues of gender. Almost all of these critiques have aided us in understanding the lens of um, adolescent spectatorship. However, little to no attention is given to films centered on more mature characters and the older audiences who watch them. So Cara M. Kavarin's provocative essay, You're All Doomed, a socioeconomic analysis of the slasher film, expresses exactly why this is needed. So her essay contends that the slasher cycle is an important one to teenagers of the 1980s because it grew out of the general struggles of the 70s, particularly the heavy economic issues from the mid to late 1970s. And she argued, quote, summer camps, small towns and suburbs, the very hallmarks of safe middle-class America, the world their baby boomer parents created for them was in fact not safe at all. They were faced with the tough reality that they would not be as financially successful as their parents. In slasher films, this looming uncertainty took the form of an unstoppable killer. In reality, it took the form of rising unemployment, cuts to social services, loss of unionized manufacturing jobs, a shrinking middle class, rising tuition costs, and the resurgence of the Cold War. So Kavarin's statement resonates with much of the other writings of this era of the horror film, and it's striking to me because much of what she states as an issue for adolescents could very easily be applied to the tensions and concerns of adults in the early 1980s. You know, perhaps older audiences relate to these metaphors because they were raising the families with teens who held out little hope as they all faced uncertainty together, but in separate ways. So like other analysis on the slasher film in the 1980s, Kavarin also argues that the adult figures in these films fail to provide any kind of safety or comfort for the teenage characters. However, is it possible that the generally feckless adult figures in these more teen-centric slashers appear helpless because they've been rendered as such through their own hardships? So all my paper is suggesting is that we should explore this further. Benjamin Mead is one of the few critics looking at adult spectatorship. According to his dissertation, Adult Motivations for Viewing Horror Films, even by 1999, there was little to no studies on genre spectators over the age of 21. Mead argues that by concentrating on younger viewers, analysis has ignored, quote, a population which may have viewing motivations inconsistent with the adult ages over 25 and over audience, end quote. Mead adds that his that prior attempts to look at older audiences remains largely anecdotal. So his research is built on cultural theorist Christian Metz's 1955 essay, The Imaginary Signifier. So in that essay, Metz suggests that viewers need to identify with characters on screen, either in a primary or secondary stage, with the second secondary stage identification involving association with characters on screen, characters most like him or herself. By the way, you might hear my cat in the background. He wants some attention. Um, anyway, Metz's psychoanalytic theories arose from Jacques Lacan's notion of the quote-unquote mirror phase of spectatorship, where the viewer identifies with characters as though they are looking at an image of themselves re reflected back from the screen. I think the most poignant piece from Mead's paper is that he contends any evidence or study attributed to the adult viewer is constructed by spectatorship from which the spectators are missing. Adults have been rendered invisible and mostly remain absent from the discourse. So to rectify this gap in viewership studies, Mead put together two focus groups. Um, they were composed of people over the age of 30. Some were genre fans, some weren't. He interrogates several different issues in his questionnaire. A couple of the questions include, do these viewers experience a quote unquote rush from horror movies? How does the audience perceive these films as works of entertainment? 
Um, did the spectator develop empathy for the characters, etc.? His research developed several different outcomes, although he attempts to avoid generalizations. However, he did state the following about his research. Quote, findings from the frequency analysis by age showed that younger viewers differed from older viewers on several viewing motivations. Younger viewers more frequently reported that they liked being scared because horror films are exciting to watch. Whereas older viewers more frequently mentioned this to experience something different from everyday life, to escape, as well as uh, for the special effects and for the suspense. So it would appear to me that Mead is making two arguments in his dissertation, right? He supports Metz's theory that the audience desires to see themselves reflected on the screen. However, his study also suggests that older viewers want some kind of escape or to experience something other than their daily life. Um, so this is where I think um, adult-centric slashers can work as an important component for further studies on spectatorship. The slasher films of 1982 that feature older protagonists are built on characters that are relatable to the older spectator. They are sometimes career-minded or they might be experiencing marital woes, but their day-to-day -day circumstances become minor in the wake of whatever horror awaits them in the film. Therefore, there is still a relatable image reflected on the screen, but because the, horror, uh, but because the stories are fantastical, these films provide a means to escape. And of course, Adult-centric slashers just didn't appear in a bubble, right, in 1982. There are plenty of examples, and the proto-slashers that predate them, of course, are a really important component. They often featured older characters, and I think it's worthwhile to just take a brief look at the legacy of films that led up to 1982. So proto-slashers, of course, have an advantage in that because Halloween hadn't set the blueprint yet, these films weren't beholden to any kind of set structure and only became part of the slasher family in hindsight. They may only need a few elements to qualify them as such, but movies such as 1932's 13 Women and 1958's The Screaming Mimi were playing towards older audiences because studios and filmmakers were only just beginning to understand the bottomless pockets of the teen market by the 1950s or late 1950s. Later in the 70s, television took up the mantle of the proto slasher and entertained an array of films with dynamic characters of all ages. Um, one of the best examples is 1972's Home for the Holidays, which features a group of adult women, all sisters, returning to their childhood home because their father believes his new wife is poisoning him. Family dysfunction, um, alcoholism, relationship problems all come to the forefront uh, because of this abusive father. On the big screen, the notorious 1978 release, The Toolbox Murders, didn't necessarily allow for substantial characterization of the victims, but the lower class setting, the fact that they had older victims, and the killer's descent into madness after the death of his teenage daughter, I think were compelling and unique uh, to the genre at the time. It's something maybe older viewers could relate to on some level. But perhaps no other film set up the notion of how adult-centric slashers could play both against the tropes even before they were set up in Halloween and also work as a discourse for the disillusionment with adulthood better than 1976's Savage Weekend. So this story is set is about a group of wealthy urbanites, two of whom were stockbrokers, who leave the city to visit a more modest mountain region. They encounter some locals, uh, one of whom who cannot, who cannot spell and is portrayed as kind of a backwoods idiot. Um, and someone begins to kill off the wealthy visitors. But while the Mask Marauders reveal presents little surprise, Savage Weekend is not really a whodunit. It's about class differences, and it sets out to reject cultural norms by flipping the script on horror stereotypes. So the openly gay character in the film defends himself against two large homophobic men in a bar, and he wins. Um, one of the women in the group instigates an affair with a married man, and she is the one to end it as well. And the quote-unquote hillbillies are not the villains of the film. They are, in fact, the heroes. So aside from reversing certain tropes and inviting class issues into the subtext, Savage Weekend is also sort of about this ennui that drives us into madness. It actually says that the clawing, doggy dog corporate world ruin, ruins relationships and produces human monsters. So I just want to show you the bar fight scene with the gay character, just to give you a general idea of what this film is doing. And um, keep in mind, this is I had to source this not from the Blu-ray. It is on Blu-ray and everybody should see it, but um, those are hard to pull images from. So I had to grab this kind of bootleggy image.
Of course, other films came out in the interim, each one creating their own discourse on the disillusionment of adulthood. It's more that the market in 1982 was catching on to this refreshing take on the blueprint and churning out adult-centric genre content that they felt would appeal to cinema goers. What came out of that was a diverse collection of titles that, for the most part, still remain undiscovered, at least in terms of spectatorship and sometimes subtextual analysis. So briefly, I'd just like to highlight what these films were doing um, to merge this divergent need of relatability and escapism. So Alone in the Dark features four emotionally disturbed patients breaking out of a sanitarium and stalking the family of the doctor who replaced their favorite psychiatrist. The film centers its story on this heteronormative family who serve as a sort of Greek chorus to the madness around them. And insanity isn't only represented by the escaped inmates. The entire town literally goes crazy after a blackout. The hospital the escapees reside in is overseen by a doctor who uses quirky and unusual methods to help his patients. The sister of the stock psychiatrist recently suffered a breakdown herself and it put her in the hospital. Upon release, she becomes an anti-nuke activist and joins a band, which signifies that you can suffer from an emotional breakdown and find healthy means to work through it. You do not have to end up like the escapees. And many of these films feature career-minded characters, particularly women. Um, Ghost Dance centers its story on a sensitive anthropology professor who investigates the seemingly supernatural murders occurring after a dig at an Indian burial site. In The Slayer, the protagonist is a long-suffering and successful artist whose work becomes increasingly more bizarre as she sinks into madness brought about by her nightmares. And in the flawed but self-aware The Last Horror film, Caroline Monroe plays Jana Bates, an ambitious horror actress who finds herself fending off a mad stalker at the Cannes Film Festival. The film is partially inspired by the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan because his assailant was obsessed with Jodie Foster. So premises such as these can really only work through the lens of more mature characters. But no other film really captured strong and independent adult women better than Visiting Hours. And I'm so thrilled that Murray mentioned this in his presentation, which we just heard. Um, so let me just give you a little rundown of what it's about. So Deborah Ballin is a tough-talking news commentator and a vocal feminist who must fend off a violent misogynist. After the attack, she finds herself under the care of an empathetic nurse and a single mother named Sheila. The two eventually find themselves inadvertently working with a young streetwise woman named Lisa, and the three of them are eventually able to topple the killer. From the face of the film, Visiting Hours appears to be a suspense thriller with some slasher sequences, and by 1982, critics had seen it all, right? Vincent Camby of the New York Times wrote, Visiting Hours is an especially clumsy, overwrought example of the slack and hack melodrama. Variety called it lowercase horror. However, what critics negated and what has been left out of the discourse is the ways in which the women, all from different class levels, intersect with each other to play differing but equally important roles in stopping the killer. A solidarity evolves throughout the film as well in different ways. So a couple of characters only intersect briefly. Some have stronger relationships, but it's really interesting the way they all kind of end up playing a part, right? So this is a genuine attempt to craft a thriller that plays to the older audience, particularly female viewers, of course, through relatable characterizations while still serving as a means of escapism. So I just want to show you one of my favorite scenes in the film. This is how the women interact with each other, and it's, it's really, really well done. Amanda, uh, sorry, uh, we're not catching the audio for the clip. Do you have it saved separately on your computer as a file? I don't. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, we're just That's not okay. hearing it. Sorry. Well, okay, let, let me move on. So, sorry about that. That's a really great clip, and everybody should see the movie. So, anyway, finally, Deadly Games was produced in 1979, but not released until 1982. It received little attention and suffered from a poor transfer in its domestic VHS release. But like Visiting Hours, it is a thriller with slasher elements. 
Um, the story is about a young woman named Keegan who returns to her small hometown after her sister is murdered. Keegan meets the police detective investigating the case. Um, he has a friend who served in Vietnam with him and each suffers from a different form of PTSD. PTSD excuse me. The two have become inseparable. So when Keegan embarks on an affair with the married detective, the three become close as their friends begin to die at the hands of a mysterious killer. Daily Games is considered a minor entry in the genre, but it is an interesting adult theme feature that deals with marital woes, PTSD, and small town boredom. Several scenes feature the locals gossiping about each other, which gives us a window into how community can be both a bonding experience as well as one that enables clicks and ostracization. Um, the device of melodrama is used to amp up the emotional content of the film. And as mentioned previously, this is a movie that entertains a far darker ending than most other titles featuring teen characters. So I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this clip. I'm going to go ahead and start it. And then I just want to show you some of the imagery in it because I think it's kind of important. So they're gossiping here and you can see that they're looking at all the townspeople and the way that they interact with each other. And then it ends with the man talking, telling Keegan that he knows his wife cheats on him, but who would ever love him, right? And she says, I would marry you. It's a really, really sweet scene. So. To conclude, uh, all I want to say is that this area of study still remains virtually un untouched, and I think that expresses a real lack of understanding of spectatorship. To contend that there is this monolithic viewership is to greatly misunderstand the appeal of slashers on mass audiences. Um, you know, even now in 2021, nearly four decades after the release of these titles, why do movies like Alone in the Dark, The Forest, and The Slayer continue to thrive on streaming and home video platforms? Is it possible that these voracious adolescent slasher fans in the 1980s, like myself, grew into adulthood, started their own families, and have dealt with many of the same issues as the more mature characters in these films. Um, and now maybe they share a new form of catharsis through them. And I think that this is an idea worth exploring. Um, and thank you very much. That's my presentation. Interesting. I love having these deep dives on, on movies that I don't necessarily focus on a lot. They're a lot of fun. It's like homework for scholar nerds. So thank you very much. Thank you. The next paper we have is In Love with Your Nightmares, Franchise Mutations, and How Freddy Krueger Became the Hero of Elm Street with Sam R.M. Geddon. Did I say that right, Sam? It's Geddon. Geden, I, you know, I had a 50-50 chance. I apologize, Geden. He is a recent graduate of MA Film Studies at the University of Essex. His main research interests are the history and experimental applications of stereoscopic media, the multiplicities of legacy media, and the study of posthumous art. He has recently contributed to the editing of Miscalier, am I gonna say that wrong too? Presses Creel Five and the University of Essex Writing Society's The Book of Life, and is written for Queen Online, Rebel, Timescope, and the forthcoming We Are the Master Charity Anthology. His latest short film, The Land That Our Grandchildren Knew, is currently in post production. Welcome, Sam. Thank you, thank you. Everyone else on this panel has talked about how how much uh, how much they've written, like how much academic stuff they've done. I quote the body horror story I wrote for a Doctor Who book, which feels quite appropriate. Um, so I'm going to get right into this. Thankfully, Daniel is doing my PowerPoint for me because I have very bad prehistoric tech on this end. So you're going to be hearing next slide quite a lot. But um, uh, without further ado, let's let's get on with it. Next slide. Okay, so earlier this year, I binged the whole Nightmare on Elm Street series, having written about 1991's Freddy's Dead for uh, uh, The Final Nightmare for an essay on 3D cinema during my MA. I wondered why its historical critical reception was so negative compared to the other Elm Street films, because I found it to be a great surreal dark comedy compared uh, uh, a great surreal dark comedy and a primordial showcase of director Rachel Tarley's anarchic make it weirder style. Was there such a sharp quality drop-off that even if this film did not proclaim to be the final nightmare, it would have killed the franchise? That's, that's kind of where, you know, where this whole thing started. 
Um, it's no secret that the Elm Street films mutated over time from a bloody psychological horror to twisted comedy. Uh, next slide, with Laura Wylick somewhat uncharitably describing them as, quote, having largely jettisoned suspense in favor of increasingly showy special effects paralleled by the transformation of the villain from actual menace to parodic producer of a witty banter. Popular discourse surrounding the series dictates that the original was best, with its creator Wes Craven even saying through the Nunkin Widge artifice of the character Casey in his 1996 film Scream, quote, the first one was good, but the rest sucked. I believe it's reductive to simply say that the other films suck just because they changed what they set out to do. I want to pick apart the nuances and politics at play behind every sequel to find out why these narrative and tonal mutations took place. Uh, so after watching child predator Freddy Krueger slice his way through a set of teenagers and their dreams, one film a day, I would read from each film's press kit in my DVD box set to see how New Line Cinema treated the franchise as it progressed. Next slide. But this passage from the production notes of 1989's Freddy's, uh, 1989's Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, particularly stood out to me. With Freddy described as, quote, not merely a quintessential villain, but an unlikely hero whose dark sense of humor remains his saving grace, occupying a singular place in the tradition of, anti, uh, of such anti-heroes as Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman. What? A hero? Even calling the child killer an anti-hero is stretching it just a bit. So this paper will look into this eyebrow-raising assertion, going down the rabbit hole to ask if Freddy Krueger is in any way heroic. More so, what does it say if he is? Are we approaching this on two fronts, analyzing Freddy's actions and impact in text, and then his standing in the real world and how the franchise mutated as a result? I'll be measuring this throughout by the criteria set by Oren E. Klupp, which is the next slide, in that a hero is a person of fame, rumor, or legend, commonly called a hero, or is subject to hero worship. So if we're approaching Freddy from a purely textual standpoint, what do the films tell us about him? Next slide. On a functional archetypal level, Jason Mittell argues that, quote, alignment and elaboration are key components of our allegiance to an anti-hero. Freddy does not have that sense of audience alignment that his contemporaries do. While films like Halloween forge alignments of the killer through POB or tracking shots, the Elm Street series near exclusively sits in the perspective of the teenagers, Freddy's point of view more in how he warps their point of view. We never really see the world through Freddy's eyes and develop an uneasy understanding or appreciation of why he dedicates his afterlife to brutally murdering children. He's not Jigsaw who self-justifies his actions as part of a greater moral good, nor is there a greater force of evil that makes him appear virtuous by comparison. Freddy's dead addresses Mittal's ideas when his daughter Maggie roams through his memories. We see flashes of Freddy being teased at school and abused by his stepfather, presented as stepping stones to his hideousness. However, whether true or not, such as the nature of a creature operating purely in the unconscious, Freddy uses these clips to try and garner enough sympathy from Maggie in the hopes of killing her when her guard is down. Freddy's ultimate villainy is weaponizing Mattel's notion that, quote, the more we know about a character through, un through revelations of backstory, the more likely we'll come to regard them as an ally. Freddy rejects these complexities and reveals himself to be cut from the same evil cloth as his contemporaries Jason Voorhees, Leatherface, and Michael Myers as an almost bestial killer. Next slide. But his impact within the films may perversely fit a more ancient definition of heroism. Margaret Visa's concept of the enemy hero in Greek mythology is that those who had cowardly and un unlawfully slain their enemy before bad fortune at the sight of the act. In a twisted act of penance, quote, the people whom he had originally wronged must now treat him as a hero if they wish to be released from his curse. If we examine the Freddy phenomenon in these films, we see a similar sequence of events. When Freddy is freed for his crimes on the technicality, the parents of Springwood, Ohio, seek vengeance by burning him alive while he slept. Freddy's curse is to kill their kids, becoming, in the poetic words of the unfortunately named Fred Kruger Pelka, quote, a sort of bizarro Jesus Christ, risen from the grave to exact vengeance on those who did him in. Nearly every Elm Street film features Freddy's actions and murder as a community secret, 
while his malignant influence extends to the whole town as the site of his vigilante death. He's not exactly famous per Clapp's criteria, but he's certainly subject to rumour and legend, especially as the films progress. The parents of any teenage antagonist strenuously deny Freddy's existence. Uh, sorry, this froze for a second. Yeah, strenuously deny Fred's existence when their children tell them about the man in their dreams, which Amanda just now somewhat touched upon. Such is their commitment to ignoring the curse killing their children that, in the case of Nancy Thompson's parents, next slide, they both eventually turn to alcohol to absolve themselves of taking responsibility for their actions. Their children condemn the actions of their parents and blame them for suffering Freddy's wrath. Kristen Parker screams out against her mother, drugging her so as to maintain the sanctity of her delusion, while Quentin Smith is disgusted by the vigilantism of the parents and that, by operating outside the legal system with its clinical commitment to facts, they persecuted Freddy without knowing his guilt for certain. Visa states that, quote, the plague is lifted when worship for the enemy is instituted. And this comes into play here in similarly perverse ways, as Freddy's power is derived from being rem remembered. 2003's Freddy vs. Jason shows the town institutionalizing affected teenagers and forcing them to take Hypnosil to stop him from manifesting. Their actions, while working so Freddy's never remembered enough to, re to regain power, are also a twisted form of worship with the very worst cases placed in perpetual, dreamless comas, comparable to devoting oneself to lifelong monastic prayer. The purest expression of the enemy hero model, though, is in Freddy's Dead. Having killed every last child in Springwood, the adults, in a state of grief-induced mania, openly acknowledge and venerate Freddy in a frenzied hope that their repent will bring children back to the town. The school teaching Freddy history satisfies the epic qualifiers for a hero, in being remembered in glory by a hero cult. The fact that it's being taught to empty seats, though, demonstrates that this ritualistic glorification is not true, sweeping remembrance, which fuels Freddy's desire to expand his influence beyond Springwood. Next slide. While he may not qualify as a hero or anti-hero in the mechanics of narrative, Freddy's impact as an, en as an epic enemy hero who is worshipped to mitigate his wrath is quite potent in these films. In fact, the 1994 meta-sequel, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, makes a point in saying that Elm Street's many sequels and public adoration had trapped the true evil essence of Fre Freddy, quote, like the genie in the bottle. The idea that Freddy is the latest manifestation of an ancient evil chimes with Kara Shimabukuro, our esteemed chair, who I hope I'm not misrepresenting here, uh, making brilliant connections between him and the boogeyman, saying, quote, Folkloric figures do not completely change through time. They simply become reimagined, providing us a lens through which to view our own world. If this is the case, what does Freddy Krueger, as the manifestation of a folkloric evil in the 1980s, say about our world? Using Clapp's criteria provides us with a very disquieting answer. Next slide. Freddy is famous by virtue of being a franchise movie star, and if the press kit for Dream Warriors is to be believed, has a worldwide mythic appeal in that, quote, teenagers in Yugoslavia tell Freddy jokes. Young people in India see him as the contemporary manifestation of a traditional evil spirit. Next slide. Contemporary articles from the LA Times and the Rolling Stone use the term heroic to describe Freddy, for better or for worse. And while I realize this is something of a recursive loop, he was certainly a hero to New Line, as he single-handedly transformed the company from a small-time distributor into the production juggernauts that would create such films as The Mask, Blade, and The Lord of the Rings trilogy. And Freddy's idolatry id cannot be denied in the realms of worship. Once again, referring to Clap, Freddy is the frequent subject of homage, having had songs written about him and being a popular choice for cosplay at Halloween or conventions. Next slide. His formal recognition came at the apex of the original franchise, when Los Angeles declared 13... Friday the 13th of September 1991, Freddy Krueger Day, at a ceremony involving his actor Robert Englund to promote Freddy's Dead. Freddy's Dead is quite important, this whole thing, and I, I, will, not, I will not be taking questions on that. Um, and finally, uh, next slide, one only has to go to any convention that Englund is attending to see scores of Freddy fans lining up to not only meet him, but if they pay a premium, have a picture taken with Freddy himself in the famous boiler room that so many of the Elm Street films return to. 
seeing this, I would have actually paid to have a photo taken with Robert Englund as Freddy, but London Film and Comic Con was cancelled last month, so I couldn't spend £130 for a, 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 a conference gag. So, oh well. Notorious child killer Freddy Krueger is, by Claps metric, a hero, albeit one with none of the virtue we would optimistically ascribe to the role. But how do we reach this point? Next slide. <laughs> well, Freddy uniquely sits at the intersection of monstrosity and celebrity. While Jason, Leatherface, and Michael are reasonably single-minded creatures with varying degrees of arrested development, Freddy, while, simple, while similarly uncomplicated in his primal desire, is, un is charismatic and has a, with a perverse sense of humor and a predilection for theatrics. We see this when he infamously says, I'm your boyfriend now, when Nancy calls Glenn in the original Nightmare and turns the phone into his tongue, and when he cuts off his fingers just to freak Tina out. Indeed, where other slasher villains would get to the point, Freddy would pursue you with all the pomp, self-assuredness and innuendo that, say, Freddie Mercury would display at a Queen concert. Next slide. Now, much like how King Kong is, according to Peter Suderman, quote, Hollywood's first visual effects movie star, as memorable and engaging as any played by human actors. Freddy Krueger may just be, possibly, maybe, up to debate, of course, Slasher Cinema's first celebrity, insofar as having a memorable and magnetic star power that is wholly apart from that of England. This is best seen by the fact that MTV promoted Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, with an hour-long special about its presenter trying to get an interview of Freddy. The character became the star and still received his own adoration, where other stars known for big roles are beloved for the ideals that their characters represent, like Mark Hamill and Luke Skywalker. But even, Freddy's star, even with Freddy's star power, it doesn't change the fact that he's spending the running time of these films brutally hacking apart teenagers. Frankly, that's the impetus of, fran of the franchise mutating from a pure horror to a more dark comedy. Next slide, I think. Yes, yes, next slide. Yes, um, the term franchise mutations, which I'm sure someone has a far better name for, is a media phenomenon where something is made at least partially in response to the reaction of the pe to the previous text. Whilst a popular assumption that the films made Freddy funny and therefore arbitrarily worse, I argue that it was Freddy so quickly becoming a pop culture icon that shaped the course of these texts. He's not the symptom of these films changing course to chase trends, He's the trend they're chasing. And the key to un really understanding this is to view Elm Street as a transmedia entity. Henry Jenkins, of course, coined the term as an example of media convergence, which, quote, integrates multiple texts to create a narrative so large that it cannot be contained within a single medium. To supplement what I call the flagship text, i.e. The, the main medium that all of us converge upon, audiences may watch cartoons, read books and comics that completely experience. In short, quote, to truly appreciate what we are watching, we have to do our homework. Now, while New Line did not mastermind some grand sweeping multimedia narrative like, like the franchises of today, their mass merchandising of Freddy certainly created a perceptual patchwork which impacted the flagic texts. If you love this, next slide. By the dream child whose press kit explicitly called Freddy a hero, we saw such extra textual media as the Elm Street NES game marketed towards kids, the Freddy's Nightmares anthology show, where Freddy is rendered as a goofy, Crypt Keeper-like character introduced in every segment, the Freddy Fan Club, and even Freddy's Greatest Hits by the Elm Street Group. Is it any wonder that Freddy stopped being a symbol of violent, repressed, perverse fear when any kid can beat him up on their Nintendo and then flip over to MTV to see him rap with the Fat Boys? But where did this particular strand of the mutation come from? The answer on the next slide is Dream Warriors. Not the film, the song by Dokken. While most of the music video is standard Elm Street fare with Freddy stalking Kristen, the inherent campiness of the band using the power of rock and roll to defeat Fred in Freddy is elevated to parody in the final shot, with Freddy jolting awake, clutching a little girl doll and declaring, what a nightmare. Who are those guys? As you can see right there, that's my favorite shot in the whole in the whole video. 
with the pop culture machine that was MTV broadcasting the video to an infinitely wider audience in a theatrical release, this one shot cemented the image of Freddy Krueger as a silly quip maniac for the rest of time. It also allowed him to become a full celebrity. After Dream Warriors came regular appearances as a VJ on MTV, as well as that Dream Master promo. It's why England received top billing for every film from the Dream Master onwards. There was a fair bit I wanted to cover in this paper that I jettisoned for time, including the significance of Freddy's name towards his celebrity, and the inherent problem with the sadomasochistic monster being the star rather than the final girl. But I wanted to end it off on something slightly less academic, but hopefully insightful and worthy of discussion afterwards. Taking Casey from Scream's uh, comments seriously, the first one was good, but the rest sucks. I never felt that, as all of them had great thrills and imagination behind them. Again, I loved Freddy's Dead. I loved it. But true to form, true to the form of this essay, I think the sentiment echoes more specifically on Freddy, conflating that he sucked with that he changed. Next slide. And I think that's something consistent across all slasher monsters. We don't like them changing. Vera Dika, Shima Bukuro, among others, identify that the slasher monster is inherently rooted in the past. The thrill of seeing new Halloween films is that the years have changed Laurie Strode in a multiplicity of ways, but Michael Myers is still the same creature hunting her, which both forces Laurie to confront him from a different vantage point in life, while still contending with the metaphorical wounds from the past he is, open up, he is opening up with his pursuit. A more pointed example of this can be found in Psycho 2. Next slide. Norman Bates is released from a mental institution after 22 years, having exercised his murderous mother persona and is as close to being a well-adjusted and upstanding citizen as possible. Norman gains greater depth as someone desperately trying to move on from his past transgressions and find fulfillment. But Lila Crane, believing he is beyond redemption for the murder of her sister, actively works to destroy his sanity and revert him back to the Hitchcocking psychopath we all know of him. In the end, just that happens. Because at the intersection of Norman's monstrosity and humanity, we want Hyde to win over Jekyll because slasher films specifically give us the space to experience and reckon with the darkest shades of humanity. England sums it up best in saying that, quote, the nightmare movies are an attempt to purge modern demons. We all live today of a constant sense of vulnerability, with an awareness that at any moment, something horrible and unexpected occur in your life and change everything, immediately and dramatically. Films like Nightmare can give you a way of vicariously staring that, fe that fear down. In doing so, they make you feel more alive. Slasher villains are the epitome of death. They may have thematic overtones and connotations about what we associate with it, but death doesn't change or mutate or become more complex. It's one of the few absolutes of existence. So what of Freddy, who was intent never changed about the series, does change in execution relative to his wider cultural standing? What happens when death is the hero? Next slide. I don't think I could even begin to answer that question even if I had time, but I think this is what inhibits fans from really embracing the latter Elm Street films. Even though by and large they're entertaining, imaginative and have thematic worth, the idea that the Freddy of the original Nightmare is the same creature in Freddy's Dead, when their MO is so far apart, it seems too much to overcome. For that, I would like to recommend something from Shimabukuro. Just as folklore, and in the context of her, franchise reboots are, quote, tales being passed down and retold from new generation. Watching these films as variations of the same story told through different dramatic lenses, the gay nightmare, the Christian nightmare, and so on, can enrich the experience despite the desperate ways it tries to establish a continuity between them. This is actually what I thought when I read New Line compare Freddy to the likes of Dracula. In Bram Stoker's novel, he is anything but a hero, but the same story being told every time mutating to fit into the culture it is adopted by has made Gary Oldman's bloody romantic just as, just as valid as the monstrous Count Orlock. In that same way, all Freddy's are equally valid as interpretations of the same pop culture boogeyman. And hey... We all have different nightmares based on the same anxieties surrounding the human condition. So it, it, it makes sense for Freddy Krueger to respond differently to whoever might be dreaming the dreams of these films. Next slide. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, Stan, that was wonderful at, with listening to everybody's papers. I thought probably a good place to start is to go back to the the title of the panel, right? So nuance and, and strategies. So it seems like we have a lot of intersections with the idea of nuance as storytelling and rumor and folklore and popular culture, but also the idea of strategies with the the HISMED that, that comes up with both Amanda and Murray's papers, but also the idea of how that theatricality for both heroes and, and using the different elements starts off. So uh, we have a, a question for Sam. We'll start with most recent and I'll go back uh, that Alex had in the chat of what to make of Freddy as consumed in a nonlinear fashion, specifically talking about those of us that grew up with the films coming out of uh, VHS and the paratext that you talk about. Um, seeing the amount of order, like in terms of like in text, if you're just watching the films, arguably he doesn't change so much in terms of his his, his mo. In terms of you know he wants to kill people because that's that's just what he does to be very reductive. It's more so the tone of which he does it. Like um, uh, for example, in the original Nightmare, you you see you see him kill Tina by by grabbing her and like throwing her against um, you know, uh, against her ceiling or br brutally slashing her. In Elm Street 4, you see him in a pizza parlor with, with Alice Johnson eating a pizza made of meatball souls. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference in terms of how, how he goes about it, the, the, the tone of which he pursues these things. Basically, I kind of see it as, as, as these films progress, he finds more ways to amuse himself rather than strictly killing people just for the sake of killing them. And um, the way he changes, it, it, it's more so, you know, connected to the wider, you know, the paratexts, the fact that um, that he becomes such a pop culture icon. Again, the fact that he is in an NES game means that he's he is infinitely more. He he's become sort of not quite uneasily kid friendly in that regard, and the films kind of reflect that. Like, um, there's barely any blood or gore in Freddy's Dead. You you could take your uh, your 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 tween, you know, your your twelve, thirteen year old to to watch Freddy's Dead, and they'll probably love it, um, because because it's it's high it's, it's high fantasy, but there's not a lot of gore there that would distress them the same way the original Nightmare would. I think that's that's more or less it. Thank you so much, and and both Daniel and uh, Dawn Keatley had uh, I think questions that sort of go together for Amanda, talking about how. Um, with adult-centric slashers, how those representations differ from teen slashers, specifically with the idea of punishment, right? So in the, the youth-centric slashers, uh, they're, the teens are punished. Are the adults punished or are there different um, sort of focuses with the adult-centric slashers, Amanda? That's a really good question, and I think it depends on the film. I think you could argue that in something like Deadly Games, where there's a lot of infidelity happening in the film, um, that perhaps they are being punished, <clears throat> excuse me, for that. Um, for me, it's more about um, kind of how the movies tend to end, and they're, they're all different. I don't want to generalize, but well, I was talking about how in some of these movies, the adult figures don't make it, and we've been kind of building up this final girl over the last four decades, right? That as this really strong, resilient character. But I think that the, the sense of nihilism that follows movies like Deadly Games and The Slayer are um, saying something kind of more devastating about just being an adult. Like to survive something like that, if you're lucky, I feel like there's, there's less sense of hope to the films, which makes them really interesting and um, kind of poignant in a way. Um, and makes them slightly different uh, than the onslaught of teen-centric slashers. But in terms of punishment, I hadn't really thought so much about what's happening to them. But there is some clear um, crossovers, like in Visiting Hours, for instance, the killer sees the women as um, really bad people because they're independent and um, they're uh, confident and they're living their lives without men 
And he doesn't like that. And in a way it kind of intersects with this idea of like the sexually promiscuous teens. So I guess they intertwine and they're separate at the same time. I'd have to really think about a better answer, but that's what I have. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I actually had uh, a question for, for Murray and it was something too that, uh, that came up um, with both the chat and I saw with some of the Twitter feed is this intersection with what you're talking about with HISMED uh, specifically, you know, we have this very complicated history with hospitals so far as both mental and physical health, right? They're, they tend to become boogeymen, right, with the settings. But it also seems to be very gendered, right, that, that women are experimented on or sterilized, right, with history. And I was just curious about sort of how much of that, that actual history you saw um, applying to your work. Well, I, I mean... Uh in the in the longer piece, I talk about like uh, the differences between coma and um, and uh, and and uh, X-ray as they're represented in the hospital space itself. Because in coma, which is about all of those things, about experimentation on on uh, on bodies, on women in particular, how even a doctor isn't safe from this. Uh, but the hospital spaces look spick and span uh, and brightly lit. There's sort of this modernist feel and this dark conspiracy is being is playing out in plain sight. And it seems to me like this uh, uh, this this formal difference uh, is uh, speaks something to the generic difference between it and a film like uh, like X-ray, where the hospital and X-ray, which I guess is shot in a real hospital that was, was closing down. Uh, it, it has a Victorian medicine, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, Jack the Ripper kind of kind of feel to it with all of these dark, decrepit spaces and small rooms and all these empty corridors and are, which are nonetheless cluttered and, and so on. Um, so I think that that uh, that X-ray, it doesn't really deal with a lot of those themes directly is the thing, but a lot of it is implied just through how the film deploys the hospital space uh, on the, on the level of film form. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question really well, but I, I think it's there. No, you, no, you, you, cer you certainly are. Okay, good. I, I think it's there, but the, the film doesn't do a lot to really reflect on it. It's just kind of implied in the images, uh, of the spaces that it, uh, that it utilizes. It's a, it's a, it's interesting for me too, especially because I do so much interdisciplinary work that that, that sort of intersection of um, I'm, I'm thinking to a of nursing Cleo's articles and then you know how that gets seen in, in popular media to me is just really interesting. Um, Sam, we had a couple of questions that I, I think to sort of intersect. Um, Mark Adams, and somebody's going to make me say big dick black on uh, a live stream. <laughs> Hard I, hope every, fan I hope everybody is really amused by that. Um, Mark asks uh, for you, Sam, about um, how do you think the icon of Freddie impacted on the attempt to remake the character in the 2010 film and what challenges there were. And big dick black had the sort of, I think, a tie in question of how does Freddie's hero status, how is that icon status impacted or does he lose it with the remake confirming that he's not just a child killer, but a pedophile? That's a good question. Um, I First of all, the, the interesting thing about the, the 2010 remake is that I believe it was made by at least some of the... It was made by um, Platinum Dune, who also did the, the Friday the 13th uh, remake. And I believe that there were some people who were involved um, in with Freddy versus Jason, a part of that. So, um, so there's there's some there's there's some kind of like fan remediation trying to reclaim um, Freddy back from from the the supposed Nadir that was Freddy's dead. I, I know that um, people saw Freddy versus Jason as like the true ending for for Freddy rather than um, Freddy's dead. So I, I think it it tries it it does try to. Um, to properly remediate Freddy, to make him unambiguously monstrous compared to perhaps the, the, the implication, because obviously, yeah, in, in the 2010 remake, he is overtly a pedophile. Um, what was the second uh, question again, please? 
Um, just whether or not that does he lose or how does it impact his hero icon status with making him a pedophile or with, um, you know, the 2010 remake? Um, I think I think he does lose it by virtue of them. I think kind of a bit too hard in the other direction. Like I, the, the 2010 remake was actually one of the first Elm Street films I watched. Um, so... It struck me that the, that um, the things that made Freddy an icon in the 80s, you know, notably the humor aspect of it, um, that, that felt very forced in the 2010 version. It, it wasn't really, a, he quipped, but it wasn't really a sense of humor. It was more a sense of menace. So I think like his, his hero, such iconic status was kind of diminished as much as possible to make him a more credible threat. And in that, and in, in the result of that, he became more of a bland archetypal slasher villain rather than you know the the celebrity that that he is the thing that makes him like indistinguish like distinguishable from every other slasher icon i always it, the a lot of the the comparisons too is that that 2010 uh to me seems a bit like the moffat and the kripke finger wagging of making fun of the fans like oh for all of you that liked freddie by the way you're a bad person for liking him because he's this so there there seems to be some i think uh creator versus audience issues going on there um so the last question I want to ask is for Amanda. And again, we, we have sort of intersecting ideas here. Bruno Filetto Lucas asks about, do you think we'll be seeing more uh, adult-centric slashers in the wake of like Halloween 2018? And Alex Venson asks about um, how that sort of fits in with the nostalgia what nostalgia has to do with these adult-centric slashers? Well, in terms of slashers, I'm not sure, but, uh, and I was talking with Daniel yesterday actually about this. One of the things that I'm seeing, so um, ageism is a real big thing for me. Um, you know, you get a certain age and you start to notice these things, right? And one of the things that I find so incredible about where we are is um, Lynn Shea. Lynn Shea is a woman in her 70s leading a franchise and making a gazillion dollars for people. She's in her 70s and we love her. And in the story, I think it was Insidious 3, we deal with things like grief and loss in really poignant ways, right? And um, it's beautiful and it's great to see that. And I hope that that continues. With Laurie Strode, what Sam said was so interesting to me um, because he said that Laurie changes, but Michael does not. And um, the thing about Lori and what we saw in the last film was now she's a grandmother, right? And we see three women, sort of like we did in Visiting Hours, these three different women at different places in their life, all coming together to defeat this sort of um, killer who's a metaphor for so many things for each girl, right? So, or woman. And, um, and that film was huge. And maybe we can start thinking about why that is. There's something poignant about, I saw in the comment section, somebody talking about Nancy and three and, and later and was Cream's new nightmare. And there's something really poignant and meaningful for being a slasher fan in the eighties to come up with Nancy, to see her in the third one. And then, and then to see her again as a mother playing herself. Like there's something about having these characters return because there's this attachment to them, but like you say, they're changing and I'm changing too. And I'm looking at their changes and I'm seeing where I am with them and their lives. And, um, and it gives an extra sense of, poignant is the only word I can think of. It, it gives extra meaning to those films. So I like the return of these characters quite a bit. And personally, I think what they did with Halloween 2018 was brilliant. And I could talk about it all day, but um, I want to see more of that. And I don't want them to do that half ass shit they did in Resurrection where they tried to kill her off. Pardon my French. It was offensive. And I'm glad she's back. And we need we need characters like that male and female represented um, in these films because we've grown up the audience that love these films and we want to see ourselves on screen. Yes, that's wonderful. And as Victoria Timpanaro pointed out, that the idea of revisiting characters as they get older, um, as the audience, right, who has grown up with these are are wonderful 